All right, let's get started with the afternoon session. Uh, but first, we had a little video problem this morning, so Simon is going to show you uh, the video that he couldn't show during his talk. Yeah, so it, it's just a one one um, uh, minute video just to, to to see what you can do with this tool when we uh, release it very soon. So it's the Danish Disease Trajectory Comorbidity Browser, and um, uh, starts up like this and you open it and then you simply just plug in codes or text and then it will pull up codes for you um, and then it will start like Google Flights pulling out the linear trajectories uh, that are based on the pre-computed data. So you take the data from the 7 million people and then you pre-compute all these transition probabilities um, and then uh, you will you will get these linear trajectories out, and then you can you can look at the nodes, and and you can see how many patients are behind these steps. You can uh, change the settings with the relative risk, and 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 you can do a lot of things that that will change how many of these. It's a little bit like Google Flights. You change the the, the cost of the ticket, and then it will pull up something else. It's the same kind of. Um, uh, idea. Then some of these links will go away, and then they will not in, end up in this network that you can click on here and have it made. And then you can man manipulate the network and change the text and so on, so that you can make figures. For example, for a, for a pay paper, and you can zoom in on on these codes and 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 again, what what does it say, and and how many how many patients are are behind it. So it's it's essentially a way of. Interrogating, uh, you can uh, save your 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 figures to Cytoscape or something else, and then you can keep working with the with the figure. So it's a way of interrogating the data from the seven million people without downloading any person sensitive data because all these transition um, probabilities or relative risks they are based on they are, they are only summary level data and they are only there if quite many patients are behind that step in these disease trajectories. And, and uh, formally, we are not allowed to show a link unless there's more than five patients that the permission, but we normally have cut off of 50 or something like that in, in what we use in our tra tra trajectories, unless it's a very rare disease, but we, are not, we cannot publish anything with less than five. Um, so I think you can look me up in the break if you want to ask questions. Because I think One very good question. I'm just wondering, this is fabulous. And can you link this to other data that you have, like genetic linkage to adopt? Not, not, not yet. Uh, but we could uh, imagine now we have genotype around three, four hundred thousand days. And, and, and we, are, we are also working with these data, and you, you could imagine linking summary data from that kind of thing with overlapping genotypes. But also remember that disease risk uh, genotypes is not the same as progression um, uh, genotypes uh, for most diseases, at least. So, so one should be careful using one for the other. Thank you. Thank you, Svan. So let me introduce the first speaker of the afternoon, who will then chair the rest of, of the session. It's Professor Ramesh Jain from the Department of Computer Science here at UCI. And Ramesh has been interested in health for a long time. And I think his presentation will be very complimentary to the talks we heard this morning about disease, because his talk is about health. And also in terms of tools, I think he's going to, to show you tools that are very complementary that uh, emphasize, uh, you know, wireless networks, uh, social media, etc. So, Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, all the talk that I heard and from the title, the talk that I'm going to hear uh, is, are very exciting. Uh, particularly, Soren's talk was uh, really exciting to me and what you are going to hear from me is slightly different version of uh, the approach but coming from different sides. Uh, to understand what I'm going to talk, you have to follow the disease trajectory or, or my interest trajectory to understand exactly how I'm going to, or I, how I got here. Uh, my training, I was a control engineer. I did my PhD in controls. Then I got into AI long time ago, 
uh, uh, much before many of you in this room were born. And uh, uh, later on, I started working in multimedia and uh, things like that. Uh, suddenly, in the beginning or early part of this century, some events took place in my life that started pushing me towards this. In, until that time, this conference is on uh, AI Biomed. Until that time, I did not know anything about Biomed. But then I had to learn very quickly things about Biomed, and I am still in the process of learning uh, all those things. So that's what we are trying to do. So I come from AI background. Uh, everybody starts talking about AI nowadays. Uh, this is one of my favorite cartoons. Yeah. Uh, that shows how success of AI is leading to change our lives. Yeah. And uh, my talk is a little bit in this direction, not as spooky as uh, this cartoon is, but uh, to some of you, it may be like this. So I'm going to talk about uh, multiple things personal, health, and navigator. And after introducing all these three things basically, then I will talk how I am trying to combine these things and trying to do some something that I find very exciting. Much of this vision was recently shared in an article in IEEE Computer Magazine, and uh, luckily they made it uh, their cover feature. So uh, all my the ideas and some of the earlier oops, some of the earlier work is shared there. So let's start with the term navigators, navigation. Many of you came here. I'm sure all of you use maps to come here, didn't they? At least until 10 years ago, we all went to maps and tried to look for things. But then suddenly some magic happened. Our life changed completely. We now never think about maps. We think about navigation systems. We sit down, we don't have to say, I want to go from this point to this point. We say, I want to go here. And after that, we don't even look at the instructions. What we do is, we just follow that sweet voice, not a nagging voice, just follow the sweet voice that keeps on telling us, now in 200 yards, you will have to turn left, and please remain in the second left lane because soon after that, you will have to again turn left. And what happens if you miss it? Unlike your spouse, uh, telling you, you are not careful. Uh, the voice quietly says, make a U-turn, or I'm going to read out you. Okay. That's, but why did this become possible? Maps have all the knowledge. What they require is two things. You used to tell, from here to here, I want to go. And then they use TASA algorithm or some other algorithm to find out how you are going to go there. Okay. But now you don't have to tell where you are. The system knows it. And system knows it continuously. At every moment of time, it knows where you are going, where you are right now, how you should be rerouted, how should you be going there. And that's the cybernetic loop that was introduced in these systems. And they, that has changed our lives. Now let's consider this Further, one of the negative things of what happened, will our kids know how to read maps? Answer is no. The real question is, will they need to know? Well, that I leave it to you. So, Oscar Wilde said something interesting long time ago, and it is stuck with me. If you look at the current disease models, all the disease models are based on population. And you, uh, you saw a little bit of that in some of the talks. We are going to use this many samples, this many examples, and we are collecting data for this many people. And uh, then effectively, we are considered to be a sample of the population. In Soren's talk, the interesting thing that I liked was, he was considering you to be a person and he was tracking it. That's what Oscar Wilde argued, that society exists only as a mental concept. In the real, real world, they are only individuals. 
Societies are formed because of individuals. Individuals are not supposed to follow exactly what society does, particularly if you live in the United States. Uh, you are supposed to be an individual. Okay. Now, when you start considering this, the companies that learn that this concept is really important are the companies that have started now telling you what advertisement you should be seeing, who you should be making friends, who things you should be liking, and things like that. They observe everything about you, they observe what you are buying, they are creating your model. But they are creating your model by using the data that they are collecting when you are on their sites. Okay? And that's what is happening. Businesses have learned that as precise models as they can build will be better for their business. That's the reason that uh, many of my computer science students, when they want to graduate, they want to go and work for Facebook, Amazon, Google, Microsoft because they are the highest paying jobs, because they are building personal models. Okay? So this is what has been going on. Another very important thing in terms of this is, this statistic that I, or this data that I'm going to show you is one year old. I could not get it for 2018. But in 2017, there were 17.85 million cars made and there were 3.98 million babies born in the United States. Let's look at some more details. For each car, we have lots and lots of sensors, and all this data is continuously being collected and going to cloud. We collect 25 gigabytes of data per hour, and that's why when you go to a dealer, dealer already knows what is wrong with your car. They know what your driving habits are. Car companies also know that this particular car model will be good for California and this will be good for Michigan. Okay? They have all that information because they are collecting all this data. No wonder. Okay? But how much data do we collect for babies? Almost zero. And the data that we collect now we claim that because of EHRs, it may be easily available at other places, but it is still not. So you are forced to ask a very important question. Are cars more important or humans? And uh, let's start considering this point a little bit more in details. Something very interesting happened in the last century. Look at this data. Very interesting data. What happened was that in the beginning of the century, the life expectancy was about 45 years. At the end of the century, life expectancy was about 80 years. 35 years gain in one century. Most of the gain was by before 1950. Okay. Because we learned how to deal with infectious diseases very well by then. Okay. Uh, our current disease models, our current medical system is a lot more organized based on the old fashioned disease models that were used at that particular time. Okay. But now, there are two questions that come to our mind. One is purely lighthearted, one is serious. I will first tell you the serious question. The serious question that comes is, when we look at this curve, particularly closer to 20th century and then continuing after this, should we start thinking about our health and diseases differently? The lighthearted question is, and hope, hopefully some of you will know the answer, is you see the pink curve and the blue curve. Yeah. What you find is that females live about 80 years and men live 74.8 years. There's at least five years life expectancy gap. You data scientists, why is that? Five years difference. The only one universal fact is that men marry the women and then they live together. I will leave the conclusion to you. Uh, 
the serious part is if you look at now our whole system is dominated by chronic diseases when we look at chronic diseases something very interesting you can observe and that is you don't even know when does the disease start because it is slowly building up so the question that you always start asking is when should you get to doctors when should you get the health care so one simple question to you when do you get the best health care in the current system in united states or in any other country when do we get the best health care you know, want to know the answer you may not agree with this but when you are about to die that's when you are put in icu that's when you are being monitored completely doctors and nurses are paying full attention to you okay. so the question that you immediately start asking is can we put people in icu from their birth and my answer is yes that's what we should be doing and that's what i will talk now so my dream is really to build this personal health system and this system will be completely based on data as we all know health is becoming equal to data in many respects and because we are talking about taking care of individuals we have to collect as much data about the individual not only the data that is collected when you go to see a doctor your life continues between those 5 minutes when you are with doctors every year or every 3 months we should be collecting that data and we should be using that data as thanks to clear sense the company and their cto charles boysi they started helping us our lab in trying to put together some of the open source software system that we are trying to design and that uh, i will describe to you in a minute okay so with that we want to start collecting the data so that we can do what is right what is right is the following when you look at what makes us healthy approximate numbers are 10% is medicine health care 20% is genetics 20% is environment and 50% is your own behavior considering epigenetics effect you realize that only about 1/4 of total effect on your health relies on your genetics and on medicine 75% depends on you and your environment. What do we do? We spend 88% on medical care. And we spend 4% on our health. Okay. So, can we change this? And uh, in order to do this, the first thing that we have to start considering is that normal state is not disease. Normal state is health. particularly in the days of chronic diseases we should focus more on health i should not be asking the question that i have diabetes uh, what medicine i take i should be asking the question that what is my health state today and if i want to uh, participate in half marathon one month from now what do i need to do what kind of training i need to go through can i want participate in that because if i say that i want to play basketball in uh, uh, one month from now my system should be able to tell uh, should be able to explain why i cannot do that yeah. you don't have the right knees you don't have this ability or that ability and you cannot train for that but for half marathon this is what you need to do can you build this kind of approach there so when we look at the current healthcare system we go through these four steps when whenever we go to a doctor 
We go to a doctor, doctor measures all kind of things starting from a stethoscope to uh, uh, seeing the response of your needs to hearing your heart and all this kind of thing. Uh, if required, going to x-rays that you saw enough this morning and all this kind of thing. After that, doctor tries to estimate what is your health state, which happens to be disease state. Then it uh, comes up with all the medical knowledge based on that what recommendations should be given to you for a computer scientist and uh, AI person it's a recommendation engine that is uh, being put there and after that it gives me the instruction of uh, what I should be doing half of the time we completely ignore we don't comply with it uh, remaining uh, 30 or 40 percent times we don't know how to comply with it so we don't do that okay? but there's no way can we change this and that's where Health Navigator comes in. Can we design a system that can guide us like that our current navigation system? The system has all the knowledge. System has the map. System can provide you right information at the right time in the right way. And you can follow that. Moreover, it's not only that. It also can provide you real-time information. Like you use navigation system not only to go to a place, but also to avoid congested road or the road that are blocked. And things like that. It reroutes you around that. Can we do that? Can we make sure that your optimal health state that you are trying to accomplish will be given to you independent of your status and things like that? Many of you may know in this room or may not know in this room that for each tennis star, there are there is a team of six experts who is continuously monitoring each and everything that's going on with them. Can we do that to a normal human being like me or anybody else? Okay. So, can we take that system that I have talked about uh, in the medical system and can we cybernetize it? That's what the goal is. Can we put cybernetics into this thing? Because if we can cybernetize it, then possibly we can do some interesting things. And that's what is the whole goal here. Look at this uh, system. This is what uh, uh, in my lab and now working with uh, several people uh, at different places we are trying to build. What we are trying to do is the following thing. This part here is all the data collection part. The data collection depends mostly on what this device that all of you carry and many of you wear this. If you don't wear this sometime soon, many of these capabilities will come in this and many. it is very likely that you will start wearing this kind of devices. There are many more sensors coming in that, uh, that could be here and uh, hopefully you will hear about those sensors possibly in the uh, talks today. But uh, many of those things are already happening. Can we collect all this data, analyze this, and like you heard in Soren's talk, can we start plotting the trajectories of those things? And that thing we call personical. We'll talk more about this beginning next slide. This is personal chronicle. This is capturing all the information about the person that we are collecting. Can we combine this with uh, omics data? Can we combine this with exposome data? Exposome data collected from many different environmental sources and put all those things together to build a detailed personal model. If we can build this personal model, then this personal model can be used in estimating health based on what data you are seeing. And we can also use all kind of regulations and medical, uh, if you believe in Western medicine, Western medicine, if you believe in Chinese, put Chinese medicine block there, if you believe in Ayurveda, put that there, or if you want to combine all of them, you can do whatever you want to do. Ultimately, it's just a, a recommendation engine uh, where you are going to put this contextualized, personalized recommendation engine there. And you give this guidance. This guidance is conveyed to the user. Now, because we are following this 24-7, this is continuously there. My phone and my this device is always there with me. So, we are continuously following this. And this is keeping track of this. 
that this person follows this kind of instruction doesn't follow this instruction or whatever so this is being done but also what can be done is that you have a dashboard with your healthcare providers so that if something is going slightly wrong the uh, nurses or some other assistants can come back and they can give you advice they can call you because the recommendation engine did not do the perfect job they can do that if the, it has to be elevated to the doctor it can be elevated to the doctor okay so this is what the system we are trying to build we have started building some components of that and that's what i will show so to build personal Uh, we, we got inspiration from Daniel Kahneman, who argued in 2005 that uh, if you want to understand quality of life of a person, you should monitor all these activities, how much time they are spending on these activities. He conducted surveys and he came up with uh, some of the things. We decided that uh, we will start with this, though we are now in the process of uh, revisiting these activities. and the events that should be derived from here i will not go into the technical details of those things but based on those things we started thinking how can we automatically start collecting those things because nobody is going to enter this you require one more life to enter the data if you have to enter the data so nobody is going to do this so the idea was can we collect all the events in your life related to health related to a social component and related to your environment automatically there and that's what we started representing let's see this let's come to this this slide shows how you can start automatically collecting this data very simple things that some of this data and this is in this everything is coming from your mobile phone from your mobile phone you collect this data every in our current system we collect it 5 minutes but you can collect every 1 minute or whatever time you can start collecting this data each element is like a pixel we call it time interval or atomic time interval we could not come up with a good sexy name like pixel for this but we will start collecting this we applied the standard segmentation algorithms and uh, all kind of learning etc to say what is really going on with you at any particular time it is start dividing your events into the meaningful events once you have done this then you can start doing something in interesting so what you can start doing is that once you have these basic events here you can start relating those to your biological events so or any other kinds of events so you start putting all this data there starting from your food to heart rate to stress level to everything and you can start adding many more things to this thing so this way now you have everything related to this so you will know that when i am coming to do this talk my heart rate is going up or down i can i will know everything about the people who are interested in this talk and who are sleeping through the talk okay? so this is a kind of thing that you can start collecting about everybody effectively what is going on is that personical is organizing event bands and this is where uh, this company clear sense started helping us we had the student developed algorithms but we wanted to start collecting data for lots of people you cannot collect data from lots of people by using standard student algorithms so we wanted to work with this luckily charles boyce he believed in this approach so he started helping us with this the current thing and i would be happy to show it to you in coffee break etc that that uh, currently oops uh, what you can do is you can start seeing this that this is taking my 24 hours and automatically there absolutely no input required uh, dividing this into different color thing each color represents different types of event that is going on with me it is automatically doing this all that i have to do is to keep my phone with me okay and with this now I, my fitbit or my iphone and all this kind of thing start giving me the data so for example i can see during which activity what kind of heart rate i had 
because I can start using this. Uh, we are uh, now starting to collect this for starting using continuous glucose monitoring for food. Uh, and I will talk about that in diabetic application in a minute. But that's what the kind of thing you start doing. You also can start collecting all the uh, normal aggregates or statistics that you want to collect. So this is what the software starts giving you. What this does is, this starts now helping you build a model for a person. Because person is genome plus lifestyle plus exposome. We haven't started doing ex any experiment on omic side. We do want to do this, but we thought that we are too early and right now we will focus mostly on lifestyle which is coming from here and the exposome part is coming from here. Uh, uh, event SOP was an uh, application that we developed in my earlier years where we combined data, the geographic data related to uh, all kind of temperature or air quality and all this kind of thing. Bring all those things there and combine these things to create these personal models. Personal models will start con containing propensity to diseases and my health behavior what I like, what I don't like, in what uh, uh, environmental condition, how my body behaves and things like this. But this doesn't have to be for all my life. This can be only for my last one week because I'm suffering from a particular health condition or for whatever period that uh, I'm interested in. We are also building on this and uh, building, and this will also be open source uh, sometimes very soon in a year or so, but uh, uh, we call it event mining things there. Effective idea is that when you have all these events related to a person, or now that we are in the world of N of 1, uh, case. So when you have this person for whom you are collecting this data over a long time, then what kind of things you want to know about this? And there you can come up, start coming up with some kind of hypothesis or you can test that hypothesis. We are inspired by a lot of writings from Judea Pearl about causality and we are starting to create a platform, something like this. We have developed the event mining algebra uh, that will allow you to take hypotheses that have been created by the system through your experimentation and the hypothesis that you want to test uh, represented using this language. And based on this, then you can start creating this to get some useful insights. What could be the insights? You are having some difficulty sleeping well on some nights. And you start thinking, why is this happening? You go to your system, your system has all this data, it has the basic personical, it has your food stream and it has your sleep data. Go through some event mining and you come up with this conclusion that is spicy food and two glasses of wine result in sleepless night. Okay. Now, how can you take care of this? How do we convert it to recommendation engine? As soon as I am entering an Indian restaurant, it warns me, you remember, you are not supposed to drink wine now. Okay. So this is how these things start working. Now in personical, we have collected some streams. We have a long way to complete these things. The type of streams that we want to collect are lifestyle, uh, we want to collect all the environmental streams, physical, biological, and behavioral. This, this is where we will have to depend on working on uh, several partners. And we will have to consider for different people under different conditions, different types of sensors being used there. We want to collect social things and, of course, what's going on with the person. I put food in the important way there that because, in my opinion, Food is the biggest challenge. Computing circles, AI and all these things, we have spent a lot of time working on several problems. Food, as important as it is to you, has received the least amount of attention. And that needs to be changed. And, that's, and the reason for that is, in fact, sometimes I like to say that whenever you go to a new place, what are the two problems you face? Number one is, how do I get from point A to point B or wherever I am going, how do I get there? And the second thing is, what do I eat? Yeah. The first problem is reasonably solved 
it is in your pocket, how can we bring the second problem? How can we solve the second problem? It is still the most difficult problem. And the reason is there is no good way to solve the problem uh, for computer vision AI vision. Food recognition is still a big problem independent of uh, doing all the progress that you have heard. If you were to Google or clarify or any system, they cannot recognize food and think there. How we collect that information still remains very important. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, so some of these things are discussed in the uh, food computing paper that's going to appear in computing surveys because it shows how every aspect of food ecosystem is related. The pizza that I ate here, the same kind of pizza from the same company supplied in a different city will have entirely different nutritional values because the supplies for, for the material came from different sources. How can we keep track of this? Now, on one hand, this appears very difficult problem, but if Google Maps have solved all the detailed problems, we can solve problem and create a food atlas. But that's something else. This is a very important thing. And for this, the important thing is to create a personal food log. Create exactly what I eat, what, when I eat, and all this kind of things. Okay. So, this is what needs to be done. Now, when we start thinking about this, now we have to recommend the food also. And when we want to recommend food, it becomes very important because you have to consider several factors. If you are going to recommend to a person, the person may have be diabetic or may have some other health problem, may be allergic to something. Okay. Maybe because of their, their religious beliefs, they want to eat only particular kind of food and things like that. So you have to start considering all those things and based on that, the, the more important part is, is start becoming is that if you tell me to eat broccoli and I hate broccoli, then I'm going to start ignoring your system very fast. But if you have a food log, you know what you like to eat. So you, you are going to recommend to a person only that you eat this thing. So if I like to eat french fries, my system being as friendly as the navigators are will not tell me not to eat french fries. It will say, why don't you eat only 10 french fries or only 5 french fries and things like that. So this is what we want to do. How will the system work? This is uh, one version that uh, uh, some of my students implemented. Uh, just for the lab purposes, uh, basically everybody talks about P4, P5 health. So basic uh, idea behind that and we started putting together this navigator that uh, your food and activity scores for the last three days are on the low side. And because of this, what uh, my recommendation to you are, you should be eating these things. We, they crawled all the restaurants, they crawled all the menus and they found out wh what are the nutritional values in uh, all those menus, uh, items and based on your health condition, all those things will be scored. Based on your personal choices, all those things will be sco uh, uh, scored so that you can be recommended where do you go. One of the big challenges that we are facing, and we have started working on this, but uh, uh, and we are even working with uh, the professor in psychology department here on emotion. Because uh, emotional health, as we all know, is extremely important, particularly adolescent depression and the senior depression. Okay? So how, how, how do we start trying to determine that kind of thing. There are many techniques that are emerging based on your face, audio and all these things, but those things are currently in very limited conditions. Can we apply those things to form emotion streams? So that is a research theme that we have started, but unfortunately right now we are in very, very early stage. This is what is really happening for your biological stream and that's what we start putting together. So, when we start putting together these things, in order to deal with health at personal level, the major challenges are how do we build model of a person from the perspective of health, not from the perspective of diseases? How do we define latitude and longitude for health? 
where you can start putting then geographic information systems layers on top of that to say that because your health state is this, you may be having these problems rather than the other way around. How can we estimate and predict health states? I will talk about this. Monitoring society for preventing diseases. If we have this kind of data collected in the living labs, we can then start analyzing groups of people and things like this. And that will start helping us build disease model. Based on this, can we start developing systems for contextual personal lifestyle recommendation? That's what we want to do. Like our credit score, can we come up with our health score? Thank you very much. So time for one question. Sorry. I think it was really a, a quick shot. I was thinking about this problem, or I've been thinking about it before. If you monitor what you are doing during the day, or for example, during work. Um, I mean, do you mind work the four minutes, and then you five minutes, then you work for six minutes. I mean, you are, you are day in our days, it's very, very fragmented. And, and I, I also saw, for example, on the list from the Nobel laureate that, that uh, being bored, for example, doing nothing, and it's supposed to be good for you to be bored, uh, was not included in, in the list. So, so do you think, uh, I can see all this in, in, in principle, but, but due to this very fragmented thing that somebody called you, then it's private work, I mean, that, that there is a, uh, maybe more than a small technical problem it, it is a technical problem. I would call it a small technical problem. It's a good technical problem. Because one of the problems that we are facing is what sensor mechanisms and what activity mechanisms should be used to define that you are doing nothing right now, or you are bored, or you are doing this particular activity. We have used a very large interval, five minutes, for our early experiment. It is clear to us that five minutes is not the right thing. It is possibly one minute or maybe even less. We don't know that. But there are lots of things to be done in, in that particular thing. And we are working on that. Oh, okay. Sure. okay. So now my role sends it. Uh, let me introduce the next speaker. Many of you in this room know Porik. Porik has been a leader in uh, machine learning and uh, many related areas at UCI and at uh, all other places. One of the best known researchers in the area. So with... Thanks, Ramesh. Uh, can people at the back hear me? I'll assume that's a yes. Um, so I'm Paulik Smith. Uh, I'm going to talk about an interesting project that I think complements some of the things we've heard already um, about patient-clinician dialogue and how we can get useful information out of that. Uh, I also do other research in the biomedical space, and I'm happy to chat at the break about other projects we have going on. Um, this work that I described is with a whole bunch of collaborators at various places, uh, including at UCI, Kai Zheng in, in the informatics department, and a bunch of great grad students. I don't know if some of them are here or not, but uh, they do all the real work uh, as usual. Uh, all right, so let's step back in time, uh, back to 1927, during the American Medical Association. And there was an interesting paper written about, uh, you know, uh, practice of medicine and the importance of the patient and paying attention to the patient and you know the practice of medicine in the broadest sense includes the whole relationship of the physician with his patient and, you know the word his there that might get updated now but uh, the idea was that even in the early days of uh, medicine there was an acknowledgement that perhaps we're drifting away from focusing on the patient and automating in, in a certain sense uh, certain procedures um, so we move forward uh, maybe about 100 years and what's happened uh, with all our technology uh, uh, we've actually probably gotten worse. Uh, so uh, there was already this morning discussion of uh, the electronic uh, health records. And so it's, this is a, a paper that's been fairly widely cited about uh, the 4,000 clicks paper. That's the, it was an estimate from a study of how many clicks that uh, doctors do on a daily basis. And I think Soren mentioned this morning, we shouldn't have doctors clicking at all. Um, and the amount of time they were doing this kind of data entry is about 50% of, the, of, of their time. Um, this has been validated. Uh, this is uh, one of my collaborators, Ty Siegel, in another study. And again, they came up with about 50% of the time that big bar there. Or actually, it's the uh, desktop medicine, the, the red stuff over here, spending a lot of the day doing uh, data entry, essentially. Very highly paid data entries. So. Um, 
you know, we're, we're smart, so we can come up with uh, solutions to this. And um, this uh, slide wants to keep running forward. So what kind of solution is there in practice now? That's something called medical scribes. You might not be aware of that, but that's people who are hired to follow doctors around and write down what they're saying. Uh, very high tech, but it works um, up to a point. So uh, this is a recent paper talking about dramatic increase in the use of medical scribes to perform many of the acquired EHR functions, especially writing down, taking uh, you know account of things. And a lot of this is driven actually by economics and insurance and so forth. But in this study, they showed that there's actually a lot of inaccuracies in this process. These are people who are not necessarily highly trained. It's not maybe a career that people aspire to do. It's something temporary. So you have high turnover and lots of issues with this. Um, and so another very recent uh, editorial saying scribes can be seen as a metaphor for what is really needed. You know, what we really need is a non-invasive entity that transforms clinicians uh, from the highest paid scribe to somebody who is unimpeded in using his or her skills and years of training. And if you think about it, if you can you know, help with the, um, the primary care physician visit, there's, uh, these, I think there's an AI in the PowerPoint program here that uh, wants me to speak faster. But um, the, uh, you know, we have over 900 million primary care visits. This is CDC data. If you could improve that and get a little bit more information about that and have the physician actually focus on the medical aspects rather than data entry, there's a lot of uh, potential impact here. So this is all motivation. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is, is how we can potentially use AI and machine learning in uh, understanding the patient doctor dialogue. When we go to see a primary care physician, uh, is there more information we can get? So I'll talk about um, what is being discussed, what are the discussion topics, can we figure those out from the, the uh, speech and the text? Uh, the emotion, we mentioned talked about the importance of emotion a few minutes ago. Uh, I'll first talk about doing that with text from, from transcripts, and then we'll see if we can do that directly from speech, and some uh, fairly early results in that uh, context. So the uh, setting here in this study, the data we have, let me see if I can hit the right button. I'm worried about hitting the wrong button. Uh, yeah, which one is? Uh, this one. That one, okay. Uh, all right, so we have uh, audio from, uh, we have a data set with audio from various doctor patient conversations, and essentially two paths here. One is where we have human-generated transcripts, obviously in practice, this is not typically, you wouldn't typically have this available. Uh, what you'd like to be able to do is do automated speech recognition, but we'll start talking about what, if we had human-generated transcripts, and there are uh, contexts where you do have human-generated transcripts in clinical studies, uh, sometimes at university studies and so forth. And then we take the, the text that comes out of these systems, do machine learning, build classification models, come up with structured information. So that's the high-level picture. Um, so the first thing I'll talk about is, is that going from text transcripts to detected topics. What were, what were the doctor and patient talking about during, say, a 20-minute uh, session? Uh, so we're going through the top path there. Uh, the data set we have, of course, you'd like to have huge amounts of data for machine learning, but uh, we have at least one very nice data set from our collaborator, Ming Tai Seal. Uh, these are about roughly 300 patient doctor visits and about 20 minutes each. Um, and then the text transcriptions were generated from the audio track of the videotapes. We don't have access to the video. We have have these text transcriptions. Um, and then each, importantly, each talk turn as people talk back and forth was labeled into one of 33 standardized medical topic codes. There's about over 100K talk turns, 279 sessions or visits, uh, and about 1.4 million words. These, each visitor session is, has about 400 talk turns in it. Uh, you could think of it almost like a dynamical system of back and forth, what's the sort of uh, trajectory of the conversation. And the talk turn um, vary in length. Uh, on average, there's about 12, but there's a lot of very short, you know, just in regular dialogue, real dialogue, yes, mm, kind of things, but maybe only one word, uh, and then some very long uh, descriptions as well. And that uh, can be a challenge for the machine learning aspect of it. So this is what the data looks like. This is real data from real people um, with uh, PHI removed and so forth. Um, so they're just talking about, um, you know, muscle function seems good. Mm -hmm. So some of these are kind of challenges for uh, uh, text analysis and speech recognition. These are not full grammatical uh, sentences as you usually get in uh, writing. It, it's, it's real text, there's interruptions and so forth. Um, but you get this sequence of talk turns, and again, we're dealing with where already the transcription has been done, we're not dealing with the audio at this stage. These are the codes, the value in this data is the codes that have been added. This is probably too small for most of you to see, but there's a whole variety of biomedical codes, uh, mental health codes, personal lifestyle and habits, psychosocial codes, and so forth. Some of these are maybe account for 25% of the data, others only occur less than 1% of the time, relatively rare. So again, a lot of skew. So with the codes, the topic labels, and the words spoken, this is what your labeled data looks like, where this is provided by 
by a human. And of course, we want to build a model that's able to go from the text to predict what this is without having a human in the loop. And so typically what the machine learning will do is pick up on keywords that relate to, say, biomedical history or preventive care, or in this case, exercise the word itself, diet the word itself. Um, and you also see some persistence here. This is a characteristic uh, of how the, the way the data is labeled. There's, there's, you, know, you talk about something, and then typically the doctor will change the subject more often than the, than the patient. That's actually a systematic effect. So the machine learning approach is fairly standard. Um, we're using classification here. We have each talk term belongs to one of 33 classes. So the input is the some representation of the words in a talk term. The output is a conditional probability of which topic or label was uh, assigned. Uh, you can do it in two ways. You can do it local for just each talk term, that's not going to be as accurate as looking at the sequence, looking at other words, other um, talk terms around a talk term to get some of the context. Uh, but essentially, you're mapping from words to class probabilities. The word representations, again, this is in natural language processing and text analysis. There's a lot of research in this, a lot of research in leverage. The sort of classical approach up to a few years ago was something called bag of words. Each word is its own categorical entity, uh, and you count the number of words and do different things like that. More recently, uh, ideas like word embeddings from deep learning, where you map each word into a dense vector space uh, proven to be very useful. And again, the sequential dependence part, you can do probabilistic models, hidden Markov models, for example. We can also use recurrent networks. One thing I'll say is that the recurrent networks or neural networks on this data are a little bit uh, limited by the amount of data we have. If we had 10 times as much data, which would be fantastic, I think the neural networks would, would do uh, significantly better. This is a pictorial representation of what I just said. You're going for words, typically some kind of feature representation through a classification model, getting probabilities of topics. And so the, to the, the talk terms are going in this direction, left to right. And you know, in the usual fashion, we've looked at different types of classifiers, different types of feature representations, uh, and evaluated different things. The recurrent neural network classifier, the neural network part operates actually at two different levels. One is per sentence or per talk term. Uh, we can use a sequential neural network to encode, in some sense, what is that talk term that sentence about. Uh, that's what's going on down here for each talk term. This might be the patient, this is the doctor. And then the entire sequence, we can use another higher level uh, recurrent neural network to track essentially the state of the conversation. And, and, and this can get quite interesting. Again, it would be fantastic if we had a lot more data. If anybody out in the audience who has data like this and about 100 times more than I described, uh, come to me at the break. We'd, we'd love to have more data. Uh, there's other systematic effects in the data. Uh, for example, I mentioned doctors start topics. So certain topics like alcohol or cigarettes or you know, a physical exam, it's much more likely the blue uh, that the doctor will start that. And so uh, for a small talk, it's 50-50. So you can put that into the model. Those are statistics. You can put it in different ways. And it does give you about a 1% or 2% boost in accuracy. OK, so what do the results look like? I'll explain this diagram. Left to right here is the sequence of a whole visit. So this would be the start of a visit. This is the end of a visit. You could think of time. It's not marked here, but maybe this is zero. This is 20 minutes later. And this is the human labeling. So in here are individual talk terms. And what you see is there are sort of uh, bursts of topics happening. Um, so this one here, muscular skeletal pain. The first one with visit flow management. Usually there's a kind of a greeting and how are you doing? And hello, that's always the first one. Um, and then you see what the models are doing. This is two different models. This one is only looking at individual talk terms, and this one is uh, looking at the whole sequence, uh, classifying any individual talk term based on what's around it. And you can see straight away that the sequential information is quite important. So if we go back here, this is very noisy. It doesn't capture the persistence at all, and that's because it's not looking at the full sequence. The um, the sequential model, which is a combination of a probabilistic and a neural network model, is doing a pretty good job. Uh, but, so basically, errors happen when there's color mismatches here. Uh, the model predicted a color that's different to what the human labeler predicted. Now, there's, there's ambiguity in the human label, so not perfect. This is often the case in, in a lot of this type of data. Um, and so if we look at uh, what our errors were counted as errors among the 33 codes, they're often actually semantically close. Um, so on the left here, the model predicted small talk and the human labeled it as work leisure activity. When you look at the, the text, when you think about it, that's really, uh, it's very easy to confuse those. It's somewhat subjective as to which uh, it should be classified as. Similarly, exercise and weight got uh, confused here. So in some sense, some of these errors are actually not really errors at all. They're just sort of different opinions of what was talked about. Uh, we can look at a thing called a confusion matrix. These are the human coded labels. These are the predicted labels. And this is basically a grayscale representation of the count of how often they agreed. 
if it was perfect, everything would be on the diagonal. You can see that it's it's not bad. It's it's it's, it's doing pretty well. And these off-diagonal uh, mistakes here, these are all sort of semantically, so they're uh, you know exercising way too close together and so forth. Um, so, uh, broadly speaking, we were, uh, you know, uh, very happy with these results. Um, let me say a little bit about uh, probabilistic and, and uh, neural models. Um, if we just look at, um, say, going from non-sequential to sequential to start with, uh, the sequential, if we just look at talk turn level, we get a big boost, and at the visit level, we get uh, also a fairly big boost. So, using sequence is, is clearly important context. That's, that's obvious, but we need to validate that in, at the algorithm level. Uh, and then if we add, you know, we do everything with the recurrent neural network rather than with a hidden Markov model, we get, a, you know, maybe a 5% improvement here, a uh, small improvement here, and again, uh, as I mentioned, I think these Differences would probably go up if we had a lot more data. All right, so let me um, uh, switch to the second part of my talk, which is about can we uh, infer emotion from the text? And there's many reasons to think this is not going to work that well because we don't have the video, we don't have the sound, uh, we're just looking at the text, the words that were spoken. Nonetheless, we should be able to pick up some, some information here. So um, the labelers here uh, labeled each utterance now, each sentence, if you like, within a talk turn, on a minus three to plus three, very negative to very positive, zero being neutral, seven uh, integer scale. Um, and it, the labels are intended to capture the emotional per state of the person speaking. Um, here we had a slightly bigger data set. So there's over 200,000 utterances. There's some overlap with the data I just talked about, but also some newer data we were able to use as well. And we have multiple labelers here, which uh, gives us some idea of inter-rater uh, reliability uh, in ter terms of uh, uh, labeling emotion. The machine learning algorithm we use is very similar to what I just talked about. Uh, you can use classification. You can also use regression here, or ordinal regression, because there is an ordering to these labels. Uh, we experimented. There isn't going to be a big difference between the two. And again, you can look at sequential and non-sequential. Here, sequential information is not quite as um, significant or as useful as it was with, with topics. I should also say this is very much work in progress. I was up late last night generating some of these uh, graphs that are really fun to look at, and my own collaborators or students haven't seen some of this stuff yet. So you're, you're kind of lucky that you get to see this. Uh, so this is quite interesting. You start to look at, this is the human estimate, an average of the human labelers for a particular session. So again, think of time going from left to right. This is the start of a visit. This is the end of a visit. And you see a few things that are pretty characteristic. At the start, you know, you go in to see a doctor. Dr. It's not going to say, oh, gee, it's horrible. You know, they're going to say, how are you doing? Everything's nice and happy. So positive emotion, by the way, positive is this direction, neutral, negative. And then at the end, there tends to be a, well, you know, you know, hopefully next time you'll feel better kind of thing. So you tend to see positive at the end as well. You also see these things that uh, I'm sure my psychology colleagues will explain to me are well known, where if you get a very negative event, there's a pullback to, uh, you know, to kind of to lighten the mood, a positive uh, change of emotional state often introduced by by the physician, uh, and we see that in, in several sessions. So, uh, just as an example here, some of these highs and lows, you know, they were talking about comic relief here, a particular author. Uh, this was actually corresponded to a physical exam where the patient, this is just the, actually the patient's emotion, uh, and then uh, the, the doctor kind of changed, lightened the mood, and the patient said, Oh, I could pass out having so much fun, and they laughed about it, and so forth. Um, and then here's some more, you know, hate to tell you, you have some bad numbers about weight, and so forth. And then they were talking about medication. The patient likes the medication, and then nice to see you at the end. So you have this kind of dynamics going on. Uh, l l before I go to the next slide, so we run the algorithms. This is actually a test session. How well can the algorithm track this emotional trajectory? And we hadn't looked at this, and we're, we're quite sort of excited about this. It, it actually works better than we expected. Um, so the red line now is tracking the green line. It's just using the text uh, to do what the human was doing to see can it get that uh, emotion. And it's it's. Uh, Correlation of these two signals, if you like, is 0.76, which is higher than we expected. Um, we did miss, it does miss some certain systematic things. So for example, this was the, the physical exam that was going on. And if you look at the text here, the patient wasn't saying, oh, this is horrible, it really hurts. They were getting very subtle signals that were clearly not enjoying it. 
but it was subtle. And again, this is the kind of thing that AI machine learning is not as good at, at humans are, but the humans were able to detect this um, consistently among multiple labelers. The algorithm kind of misses it completely here. But all the other peaks and so forth, it, it, it detected uh, very nicely. Um, here is a, another session, which is more negative. Uh, and there's also, it's also interesting to look at across sessions. Are there some doctors more positive or negative? Uh, and uh, this one is, is generally negative. Um, this is the human estimate. Um, and there was some bad news about surgery and a relative and so forth. Uh, again, you see this kind of transition from a very negative emotional state to very positive very quickly. Um, and then a physical exam, and I guess none of us like physical exams, so the, the, the patient said, actually said, it hurts here. Um, and we look at uh, the, um, you know, the, what the algorithm did, and it's, it's, it's sort of surprisingly good. There are a few places where it, it misses. It, it again missed this big dip here. And uh, this kind of visualization, by the way, is very important if you're developing machine learning systems, that uh, you actually look at the data. It's one thing I keep telling students and collaborators to do. Plot the data, look at it, don't just look at numbers. Uh, this gives us direct insight into where the algorithm is not detecting things. So this kind of visualization uh, is, is important. You can also look at a doctor emotion over time. You can track if doctor and is, is, is staying, you know, is empathetic. Are they reflecting the uh, patient's uh, uh, mental state? Uh, and here they were. Uh, this is the same uh, dip that we saw before. Doctor was saying, sorry to hear that. And then suggested some good idea and uh, polluted on some positive notes. And again, uh, the algorithm picks up on this from the text, but doesn't quite get the intensity of the, the negative emotion and so forth. But broadly speaking, uh, these results appear to be very encouraging, and uh, we're looking forward to do more. Now, everything I've shown you up to this point is from text. So we have somehow a magic person in the room that can transcribe text, and then the system could be doing its stuff uh, to summarize the conversation. Of course, that's not realistic. What we'd like to have is really 100% accurate speech recognition. So. Where are we on that front? So what we're going to do now is instead of using the, the human-generated transcripts, we'll use transcripts that come from recordings, to, from automated speech recognition. And the research question that we're interested in, and one of the research questions is, if we do speech recognition, how much do we lose in accuracy? How much worse is it? And again, this is work in progress, so I can't tell you everything, but I can give you some preliminary results that suggest the main answer is that you lose a little bit, but for actually very little. That the main uh, inaccuracies are coming from here uh, rather than the speech recognition part. Uh, so um, for reasons to do with IOB and so forth, we had to recreate the audio ourselves. Um, there is original audio. Uh, it could be gotten, but it's very complicated to get it. Uh, so we, we had students, uh, Brian and Tara, uh, kindly read the, the, uh, the transcripts. And uh, they used a variety of recording devices. And one of the things we found out is your cell phone, in this context, was as good as any of the other things. Um, the, the recording device did not was not a factor in the quality of the results that we got. Um, and then we, you know, speech recognition, you don't want to do it on your own. I mean, the companies have much better speech recognition systems than the universities have. So you just send it off very cheap to, we've done Amazon Transcribe and Google, uh, Google Speech. We're also going to do Nuance in Microsoft, we hope. Um, and, um, you know, there's a various options here, diarization, punctuation, etc. cetera. Um, there's some audio here that might play for Wiki. <laughs> See how this goes with the students speaking. Yeah, yeah, I'm not surprised. I usually have a. They seem okay. I have a um, ball to. Ball. Um, pull, pull a ball. All right, we're interested in time. I'll, I'll keep going. So you do, you, you do hear that um, uh, this is a little unnatural. Uh, so we've decided the next time we do this, we're going to get students from the uh, drama department. Uh, and and uh, so, so the results are probably optimistic, because Brian and Terry were doing a good job. It actually took a lot of work for them to do this. That was with a high quality. And if you look on the right, um, maybe we can just briefly go back. Uh, there's almost no errors. The only error that I was able to see was the word ache and uh, the word 
peanut and egg. Uh, but otherwise, it's actually pretty good. Um, and of course, you know, that it really, it, you should, that, that's doable. That's a solid, in the context, egg doesn't make any sense here. So um, now, if you knew, the, the speech recognition systems, if they have a bunch of different models you can use, so one of them is called the phone call model for lower quality data. And if you run that model, you get much worse results. So you've got a lot of wax in your ears. Uh, the speech recognition said Google to work for you. Why did it say that? Who knows? It's a black box. Um, and you can guess which company uh, did this. Uh, and so let me uh, show you just again the same plot I had before. And this is using the higher quality speech recognition system. This is the human transcription. This is off the. Uh, Sorry, this is the human labeling. Uh, this is from the, what the classifier did off the human generated transcription, and this is off the speech recognition. And these two are almost identical because the, the word error rate is very low. So there's really not a lot of error in what we're doing coming from the speech recognition, partly because of the, it's, it's, it's a, a nice clean uh, audio environment, and the real errors are coming just in going matching the human uh, labels here. Uh, low quality ASR, you get more errors introduced uh, up here. Um, and this is another transcript. Uh, oh, why did all my <laughs> that's interesting. Uh, so when you go from a Mac to a PC in PowerPoint, it looks like all your data disappears. So what's supposed to be here, this is, uh, you'll have to trust me on this, uh, is that these don't matter. These are clustered together. And there's three uh, speech recognitions from Google and one from Amazon. The, uh, the best Google one is, they're all here. There's actually some results from the Google speech recognition that are better than the human generated transcripts. I think that's just noise, but they're essentially, the word error is about 0.1, 10%, but there's no uh, decrease in accuracy. I should explain this. This is the word error is speech recognition. This is the decrease in accuracy we got from using speech recognition rather than human generated transcripts. Here's where we'd ideally like to be, and we did get there with the Google video speech recognition. The worst one is also a Google one. It's the Google phone call one. It's up here by the 30% word error rate, but you're getting only 6% uh, decrease in accuracy. And the Amazon one uh, is sort of in the middle. So if we take the average of the Googles, they're about where Amazon was, uh, and so forth. Now, the point at the top is what did we learn from doing this? Um, there is considerable variation in accuracy across the systems. Uh, the cell phone recordings uh, don't matter. I mean, sorry, uh, which device we use didn't matter. And the reduction in classification accuracy, you know, if your word error is about 10% or 20%, you're, trust me, there was data here. There were, actually, it's a beautiful uh, uh, set of data because it's almost linear. And so your uh, word error rate translates uh, into decrease in, in topic classification accuracy in a very nice fashion. All right, concluding comments. How much time do I have left? Negative time? One minute. All right, in one minute, um, in going from research to applications, this is research lab stuff. Uh, we are doing stuff. Uh, this is part of a project with some psychotherapists where they're applying these ideas on large scale at, at, at various universities. There's a commercial startup, and they're doing this with real speech and real uh, uh, patients, and, and uh, it, 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 people are pushing this ahead. Uh, there's also a project here. Uh, some of this work is funded by SAP, Tobias is here. Uh, it's been a very nice collaboration. And one of the interesting factors here is that the human factors aspect of Kai Zhang is quite important here. You have to really think about that, take it into account. Um, I think there's engineering improvements that can be made in the NLP and the speech recognition. Um, and uh, more, more data would help, certainly, for this kind of thing. Just general caveats. We've heard some of these things before. Machine learning is not a magic bullet. I'm sure everyone in the room knows this, but just to repeat it, uh, good for problems, a lot of theory and uh, little theory and lots of data. Um, and you really want to be careful about what type of problem you pick to use machine learning and AI on. So we've seen examples of biomedical images is, is in many senses an ideal problem. But uh, if you saw Sorens talk about noisy sparse longitudinal EHR data, uh, this is much more complex. There may be interventions, there may be missing data, all kinds of things going on. And research results, stuff published in papers, doesn't always really translate to real world situations. They're in idealized situations like you saw in our work. And there's a lack of external validation. So there's the, the, the accuracies you see on data is for the same environment as the model was trained on, not in a different hospital. In fact, if you look at some of the big papers that have been published in the last year or two, there's a surprising lack of external validation, and that's really, really important. And commercial vendors tend to oversell things. Uh, you know, IBM and Microsoft advertise speech recognition rates below 5%. Uh, Google, to their credit, have published on uh, realistic word error rates of more up around 20%. Uh, so again, just th this is probably much more realistic than the, the 5% that's sometimes advertised in marketing uh, materials. Uh, we heard about ImageNet in the first talk this morning. 
Um, I'm just going to show you that if you give to ImageNet images that it didn't see before, they're totally different. Uh, it'll classify them, it thinks this is a guitar and thinks this is a penguin. Uh, what's more worrying is it thinks it's 99.9% it's confident about this. So in case you thought, you know, computer vision is solved and these systems are, uh, you know, very reliable, they don't know what they don't know often. So it's fine if you keep giving it more penguins, but not if you give it images like this. And you might say, well, what if you give it more images like guitars and penguins, not those strange images I showed. There's some nice work out of Berkeley uh, this year that shows, in fact, th th there really is a, a performance drop-off that we, we are, in effect, overfitting. So I think any of the numbers you see from anybody, including me, you should say is probably optimistic. And if you take that and do it on your own data, you're going to get lower, lower results. Um, so going back to the theme of the talk, I think AI can help with providing physicians with more time to focus on patients rather than data entry. And technologies like speech and, and text classification uh, show promise, but there's there, there's a gap, uh, and there's more work to do on this front. And I'll conclude uh, with a quote. Uh, so AI can have a role here, but it will not simply be through better predictions. Instead, the focus needs to be on the effect arm of AI. The change process will take place in hospitals and physician offices, and, and not in Silicon Valley. I think sometimes, as technologists, we forget that. So thank you. Sorry for going over time. If there is a burning question, we'll take it. Okay, thank you very much for it. Uh, this one will take some time. Because it's uh, 55 he joined us just uh, last year. And uh, he's working on something very really interesting problem behavior or mental problems. Awesome, great. Uh, thanks. Um, so I'm going to take a slightly different tack here. Um, very much from my background. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist um, by training. I'm here in the Department of Psychological Science, uh, and my work focuses on using technology to expand um, access to and accessibility of mental health services. So there's a lot of ways in which AI has been intersecting with the work that I've been doing. Um, I think really I'm going to talk at a very high level here, um, given that I'm assuming most people in the room here are not clinical psychologists. Uh, part of the things that I want to convince you guys of is that that we as clinical psychologists have no idea what we're doing and we need to do a lot better. And we really need smart people um, with novel methods to try to solve some of the problems that we haven't been able to solve our, ourselves. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the work that I've been doing that have been addressing some of these problems. Um, so just to wax you know, philosophical for a second about the issues of um, clinical psychology and mental health, um, we have a system that is really, really not working. Um, the majority of people who need mental health resources do not get them, and a lot of the reason for that is we almost entirely um, rely on people self-presenting for mental health problems. And so we have a system that uh, of care that requires people to come reach out for need, um, when in reality, there's a lot of people out there who are really struggling, really in need, and are essentially not getting the help that they need. So I think that's why this, this image here of an individual kind of holding their hand out of the, the river. And I think that something that we need to be thinking about when we think about the potential of AI and machine learning to impact and improve uh, mental health services is how can we actually, instead of waiting for people to kind of, as they're drowning in this river, um, find their way out and find their way to uh, us, how do we actually find our way to go into those rivers and pull out the people who need help? Uh, so just to talk a little bit about um, mental health and the prevalence of it, because again, I'm assuming that many people here do not have the background that I do as a clinical psychologist. Um, I think it's really important to emphasize, we've heard a lot of talks about health. Um, there really is no health without mental health. Um, and there's two ways I want to be thinking about mental health here. One is I think the way that we traditionally think about it, which is a diagnosable mental health condition. These are extremely prevalent in and of themselves. Um, so about one in five or uh, one in four people in their lives will experience a mental health condition. So this isn't something that is, you know, going on out there. This is something that um, is going on here. And I, you know, recognize in giving this talk that um, there might, there are likely many people in this room who've had uh, personal or um, family friend experiences with mental health. Um, I think the other thing worth emphasizing is mental health is not just 
having a mental health issue, there's a continuum of mental health functioning, just like there's a continuum of health functioning. That's why I have this um, figure here. And all of us um, go through experiences where we have maybe acute mental health needs, being stressed, being burned out, being overworked, that don't cross the threshold to a diagnosable mental health condition, but there's something worth thinking about and something worth thinking how technology and AI might be able to address um, some of these issues. Um, I'm also going to show a figure around um, mortality issues and have a slightly different sort of bend on the discussion here, but um, I'd really like to sort of note that we're really, again, what I said earlier, we're really doing a bad job. We are not bending the curve on behavioral health issues. In fact, they're somewhat getting worse. So what I have here on the left-hand um, side of the screen is um, deaths per 100,000. Um, uh, across some different developed um, countries, and we actually see that the uh, mortality rate in the United States is going up over the past couple years, and this is almost entirely related to behavioral health issues, um, mental health issues sort of broadly. So uh, specifically, we see the suicide rate is rising um, over the past couple of years. So that's that red bar here. We also see um, deaths related to um, drug overdose um, are, are rising over the past couple of years. And so you know, despite all of our advances that we've made in mental health treatment, um, we're, not, we're not bending the curve on these things. We're getting worse in many regards. If we look at um, common mental health issues, depression, anxiety, uh, if these things are not getting worse, they're at least sort of steady over the past um, 100 years. And so uh, despite the fact that we have what we know are effective mental health treatments, um, we're not able to get these treatments out to people in the ways that are actually um, improving their lives. Uh, this is one thing that I think contributes to that problem. This might look like a political map, but it's not. Um, it's a map that lists the uh, distribution of uh, licensed psychologists across the country. So the red areas is where we have very high concentrations. Uh, and the blue areas are where we have very low concentrations. In fact, in the United States, um, one out of uh, every three counties has not a single licensed clinical psychologist. Uh, and if we look across the mental health profession, this is not only a problem with psychologists. If I showed you a graph of psychiatrists, if I showed you a graph of licensed social workers, uh, you know, they might change a little bit, but overall the, the pattern will look the same. Um, if I showed you a map around the world, we would see sort of um, uh, similar um, trends. In fact, there are more psychiatrists practicing in San Francisco than there are, the, are, are on the entire continent of Africa. So um, this just tells us that the, one of the big needs we have in terms of trying to address uh, mental health issues through professionals alone. Um, a couple other sort of problems we see with mental health services. One is lack of engagement. 60% um, of people are not receiving any care. Um, so these are people who have a diagnosable mental health condition. So very few people get care. Um, when we look at mental health visits, um, even the people who get through all the barriers um, and they actually make it into a um, mental health professional's office, the modal number of visits um, in mental health care is one. So that means most people show up to one visit and they never come back. Um, so engagement is a problem. Um, there's a big lack of quality. So most people who receive services don't get evidence-based practices. So again, 60% don't receive care. So we have 40% who actually make it through all these barriers and they do. Only 20% of those actually receive evidence-based mental health services. Um, our care is fragmented, it's episodic, and it's reactive. So we often provide care to people when they're in very um, acute need. Uh, the number of times I've had someone come in my office where it's like, if I had you a year ago, maybe we could have done, we would have had a lot easier job, but now at this point, you've lost your job, you've, lo you've um, lost all your relationships, um, you're in you know, worse sort of health, and now we have to sort of deal with the mental health um, issues kind of on top of that. And so I think that one of the things we have to sort of think about is how do we take this sort of fragmented, reactive uh, care system and move it to a more sort of proactive system. Um, and sort of we have a lack of measurement in mental health. So the gold standard um, measure for depression, which is an area where I work in a lot, is a nine item self-report measure. So the way that we figure out if you are, if you have clinical depression is we ask you questions about what's going on in your life. And I think um, this is very different from a lot of other areas of healthcare where we actually have people take diagnostic tests, where there are lab results. And so we need to think about how we can actually develop more objective measures of mental health 
to be able to um, track progress because I think what um, I say time and time again, and this is not you know a quote I came up with, but you know if it's not measured, it doesn't matter. We can't change something if we don't measure it, and so we need better ways to actually measure um, mental health aspects. So I'll talk a little bit about different aspects of my own work that have focused both on the ways that um, technology and AI can possibly improve treatment as well as sort of identification of mental health issues. Um, so I think for part of sort of thinking about this, we have to think a little bit about what can technology actually do well? What is the um, artificial intelligence able to bring in that the human being isn't able to do as well? And so I think, you know, when I talk about this work, um, again, I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm not trying to replace clinical psychologists. I'm not trying to get rid of, um, uh, replace sort of human care. But as I showed you in one of my earlier slides, we don't have enough professionals, we're never going to get enough professionals, and so I think we have to think about ways in which AI and technology can supplement or enhance the care that we're providing through traditional face-to-face -face services. Um, technology is really good at connecting people. Um, it's really good at collecting passive data to reduce user burden, so it can get a lot of information about a person. I can look at for patterns um, in the data. It can also disseminate and spread resources quickly and broadly. And so I'll talk today mostly about the analytics and the passive data collection issues because those are the areas that are most relevant um, to AI. Some of these other aspects are um, things that I'm very interested in my other um, parts of the work, thinking about sort of the social um, aspect and how do we actually spread and disseminate things through technology. And I'll touch a little bit on dissemination um, as I talk about sort of this intervention platform that we've developed. So. I'm going to talk about sort of two broad examples from my own work. Um, the first I said was interventional, and so I want to talk about this platform that we developed while I was at Northwestern University. It's a platform called IntelliCare. And what IntelliCare is, is a suite of different mobile applications that are modularized to um, uh, represent sort of singular aspects of mental and behavioral health treatment. So um, instead of building sort of like one app that's going to be able to do all of these different things that um, we might want mental health apps to do. We built 14 different mini apps that each focus on something specific, and I'll talk about some of those examples in a second. Um, and we had sort of this organized platform, we called it this um, IntelliCare hub or conductor app that organizes a person's experience with the system. So the idea is that you download the IntelliCare hub app um, and you'll get some um, encouragement or some coaching that I'll talk a little bit about through that hub app that will tell you about the other apps that you might download. So what do these um, singular IntelliCare apps look like? Um, I'll walk through just a couple of examples. One app we developed is an app called Daily Feats. Uh, this was actually one of the most popular apps in the IntelliCare suite. It's a goal setting app. Um, you download it, you take a a measure of depression and a measure of anxiety, it gives you some feats or some tasks that you need to accomplish each day. Um, these things sound very simple, but one thing actually that we heard from our users is that this was very um, rewarding or um, validating to them that we broke things down in this way because these things are really hard for them and us representing them as feats actually sort of validated some of the challenges they were going through. So you can see it's things like, you know, at the basic level, I got out of bed, I groomed myself, I made good food choices. Um, you log into the app, you check off a couple boxes, whether you did that, you build up streaks. The more streaks you have, you level up, you get more challenging feats. Another app that we developed was an app called My Mantra. Um, I refer to this as the Pinterest of cognitive behavioral therapy. You create these mantra boards that are focused on um, images or pictures that follow in different sort of positive self statements. Um, so you might have a board of like, you know, I am resilient, I am strong. Um, I'm grateful, and you collect images that uh, would follow in those themes, and then the app will sort of push back those images to you um, at different points as sort of positive um, motivations. So that's um, my mantra. Um, so as I said, there's you know a series of these different apps. Um, they focus on other things like sleep hygiene, cognitive restructuring, behavior activation, things that we know work from um, evidence-based um, psychotherapeutic practices. Um, we did a, we've done a couple different things with these um, apps, and so I'm going to walk through some of our different data. Um, the first thing that was actually just really interesting is as we developed them, we put them up on the Google Play Store for people to download because it's like, hey, we have these. People should use them. Um, and so one of the things that we did is we just looked at, you know, from people who are downloading them, um, what was their use like and how many people were downloading them. So in about the first year and a half, we had uh, 
80,000 installs over 10,000, uh, sorry, uh, 76,000 unique users. And we had 10,000 active users. So we defined an active user, someone who used these apps at least 10 times. Um, this is something we see across the board in health apps as they get sort of broadly disseminated is that if you build it, they won't come. Um, people will download these things, but they typically don't sort of engage over time. Um, our rates are actually pretty good when you look comparably. Um, well, one thing that's sort of really interesting is if we look at the average sessions across these things, that people did tend to use these um, pretty regularly if they did, if they were sort of active users. So people tend to use them and people will um, download them. Uh, we also did a eight-week single-armed field trial where we actually looked to see if these things were effective at reducing depression anxiety. Um, and turns out that these were. So um, we had people who were diagnostic of uh, depression or anxiety at baseline, so people that you would typically see in clinical care. And we saw reductions over eight weeks that would be consistent with what you would see in a course of psychotherapy. So that's good. These things actually work. Um, the other thing that's, I think, really sort of interesting um, is that the use frequency, the, the usage time of these were quite brief in each individual use, um, but people in, in the field trial actually tended to sort of stay engaged with these over time. So this graph shows the number of uses each week of any app in the IntelliCare system by a user um, on that platform, and you can see it peaks a little bit about around um, week six, and then sort of um, levels off. Um, interestingly, the average time for each of those uses was about a minute. Um, so people log on, they use these apps very quickly, but they do sort of spread that use throughout the week. Um, one reason why we think that there's this sort of uh, uh, peak at six weeks is because over the eight week period, we recommended them a new, like two new apps every week for the first six weeks. And so these last two weeks, these are all sort of repeat apps that they're getting, but um, they have 12 apps that were recommended to them um, throughout that period. Um, here's another um, a, a sort of deeper dive into that data where we looked at when people were downloading apps throughout the study period. And we do see it's fairly linear throughout those eight weeks. So it's not that people download all of the apps at the beginning. They do sort of follow our suggestion to download you know, a couple at a time and then you know, use them over time. So um, it does seem we can actually use recommendations to push people towards specific patterns in terms of their use of these apps. So. One of the, the big goals of building this whole system was to move to a more model of personalized um, mental health care, um, similar to what you do on Netflix or what you would see on Amazon. The idea is we have this set of different IntelliCare apps, and could we, can we actually, using people's data, be able to figure out which is the specific app that we need to recommend to you. So in the initial sort of data that I just presented, we used sort of an off-the-shelf um, recommender system. Um, we just sort of um, took something that was simple. Um, but after we had that data from both the uh, public download people as well as our initial field trial, we actually started to train that recommender system to look at if we could um, better uh, make better recommendation, uh, recommendations. We actually have a randomized control trial comparing the recommender system to randomized um, recommendations that's currently under review. Um, but the initial data from that actually shows that people who got those personalized recommendations had greater increase, uh, sorry, greater decreases in their symptoms of depression and anxiety than the people who received random recommendations. Um, the data I'm going to show you right now is actually just taking that initial sort of data set um, and trying to figure out if we can recognize patterns among the users that would that would suggest that there some are some apps that are more would be um, better choices for people based off of the other apps they use. And it does seem to um, be the case that at least uh, if we look at the usage statistics or people's use of these apps as uh, predictors, that they do tend to um, uh, cluster into certain categories. So we find that um, among uh, uh, daily feats users, for example, that there's other apps that they tend to use more often. Among day-to-day -day users, there's other apps that they use more often. There does also seem to be patterns in terms of just uh, based off of the person. So we do see sort of um, people who are high users of apps in general versus low users of apps in general. And so definitely one of the things that we've, we saw that we had to model in terms of this recommendation engine was both a person's overall use of apps as well as sort of the specific benefits or use that they might get out of the mental health specific apps that we have in this IntelliCare system. 
Um, here's just another way of looking at the, um, the clusters. Um, and so what we found is that if we looked across the clusters, there tended to be sort of four different clusters of these 14 apps. Um, if we use those clusters to predict the benefits that people received, um, the benefits that they received seemed to be if they used at least one app in that cluster that was more beneficial. So people who used all four clusters got more benefits from people who used fewer clusters. But within a cluster, it didn't matter if you used sort of multiple apps. And so this idea that seems to be coming from this, um, this data, at least from the, the mental health intervention side, is that there might be different uh, different modes or different ways to give people sort of effective components and that if we look across these different modes, across these different clusters, the more different modes you get, the better. But for each person, there might be some personalized um, benefit that they get from a specific, I'm uh, sorry, that there's no additional benefit that they get from having an additional app within that cluster. So um, there's different ways to present different types of things to people and it's useful to have those different pathways because people might, uh, prefer one or might um, uh, understand one a little bit better, but in terms of the benefit um, that people are receiving, it, uh, we can sort of reduce these multitude of apps into sort of some um, very uh, basic sort of clusters of different um, intervention strategies. Um, and the last thing I want to present is just um, some data that we published in a, a paper in um, Jamia that showed that um, actually providing these recommendations to people did increase the use of those applications. And so what we looked at is we looked at the week after a person had an app recommended to them, what was their tendency to use the app during that week? And we did see that that sort of guided um, uh, guided the use of the app. And so what we've seen so far off this IntelliCare platform, and again, this is a still evolving, developing project, but we've seen that um, first, it does seem like we can um, group different interventional elements and mental health um, interventions into different sort of components or buckets. Um, that understanding those buckets and making recommendations of those buckets um, can actually lead to greater reductions in symptoms. And that providing people recommendations through this platform is actually a useful way to sort of um, increase their engagement. So I want to shift gears and talk now a little bit more about the assessment element of um, mental health and how AI and technology might be able to move this along. And so related to this, I think, is a very sort of important question about thinking about um, does your phone know if you're depressed? Um, uh, Dr. James' presentation was actually a really nice sort of intro into this idea in terms of showing the multitude of data that one can collect from one's smartphone. And we've been looking at how this might be able to predict various um, mental health states. Um, in some ways, you know, when I used to pose this question, I think people were very sort of skeptical of this. I think as time has evolved, people start to understand that actually your phone knows a heck of a lot about you. Um, this is actually a screenshot I took years ago when I got into my uh, car and put my phone up on my um, sort of little uh, dashboard thing. It said, uh, right now it would take you about 16 minutes to drive home. I never told my phone where I lived. I never told my phone what I, where I wanted to go. But all of a sudden it says, you know, hey, 16 minutes, Stephen, by then you'll be home. It's like, wow, that's cool and a little creepy. Um, and so I think that across, you know, different things, there's probably a lot of cool but a little creepy things that our phones know about us um, if we really dug into the data. And that information might be useful to sort of understand one's mental health state. Um, so to look at that, we um, developed a couple years ago an um, application that we called Purple Robot. Um, it was called Purple Robot because we developed it in Northwestern and that was our color and everything had to be purple. Um, purple Robot was an app that was able to collect the various different sensors that were available on the phone. Um, things such as screen use, um, app use, location, accelerometer. Um, some of the different social features, how many calls are you making, how many texts are you making, who are you texting, um, available Bluetooth devices, external devices as well. All in all, there are about, um, when we were using in the study, there are about 34 different features that are available on Purple Robot. Um, this is just an example um, screenshot from the app in terms of uh, showing the state of different features that's running on it. Um, 
This is a figure that sort of displays in Purple Robot. Um, so we did have in Purple Robot, um, based off the Google location um, feature um, algorithm, uh, the attempt to sort of predict where a person is in terms of their work or their home. This is one of our programmers. So they live, they worked down here, um, medical school campus at Northwestern. They lived up here in Wrigleyville um, near the uh, Cubs ballpark. Um, all these red dots are sort of you know travel locations. This is their bus route. Um, so this is their location data after a week, and these were its guesses in terms of where the person worked and where the person lived, and you can actually see it's you know fairly accurate. Um, the location data actually turned out to be very interesting in terms of thinking about mental health um, status. So this comes from a paper that one of our postdocs, um, Sarab uh, Saeed, um, did while working with us, in which we were trying to look at which features were predictive of um, depressive states. So what we did is we divided people into categories based off the patient health questionnaire nine. It's that nine item self-report measure of depression I talked earlier about. Um, below five is what would be considered low levels of depression. Above five is where we would start to think about sort of maybe providing treatment or at least do some level of watchful waiting. Um, we looked at a variety of different features and actually the most important features are all, were all location-based features. Um, uh, HS stands for home stay. So how long the person was at their home was predictive. Um, LV is location variance, the number of different places. A person who's not depressed tends to go to more places than a person who is depressed. Um, actually, the strongest predictors were these things that were based off of this um, feature that um, we created that we called uh, circadian entropy. And so what circadian entropy looked at was the regularity and movement across geographic space. Um, so a person who goes to the same place at the same time every day would have a very sort of high level of regularity. A person who has a lot of sort of variance in their um, movement through geographic space would have very low regularity. We found that high regularity was predictive of low levels of depression. So if you think about this in a slightly more um, concrete way, you know, when you go to work at the same time every day, when you go home at the same time of every day, when you have a very sort of routinized schedule, that seems to be predictive of individuals who are not depressed. Um, and clinically speaking, this makes a lot of sense. I think when I see my clients, when their lives start to unravel a little bit, um, when they start to get more sort of irregular in what they're doing, um, that's a time where we actually see um, it's more indicative of times when they're in um, more sort of depressed or um, um, activated states for whatever mental health issues that they're dealing with. So this has been sort of a really interesting um, uh, introduction and thinking about how some of these different features might predict mental health states and we're continuing to do sort of more work in this area. Um, this is just sort of an example from a paper that we published that's kind of thinking through how we think about building some of these models. Um, so we start from the sensor level and think about what the data quality is from those things. We then think about the low level features, um, things like location type, bed wake time, um, acoustic environment that might relate to higher level they might relate to higher level behavioral markers that ultimately sort of predict depression and anxiety. And so I think one thing that we've really found is that what's been required in this work is a lot of interdisciplinary work to really build the mapping between these different levels of features. So we don't just throw in a bunch of sensors and say, well, can you predict uh, depression? So you can, um, we instead sort of think um, thoughtfully about which sort of low level features do we point things at first and how do those then relate to depression? Building these features like um, uh, the circadian entropy, which I talked about in this um, previous paper. Um, so just a couple conclusions and key takeaways. Um, we're never gonna address mental health through professionals alone. Um, we need new, smarter models of care, and AI and technology can be a part of those smarter models, models of care. Um, we can only change what we measure, and we need better ways to assess mental health that reduce reliance on uh, self-report. And so uh, using technology platforms for data collection and artificial intelligence and machine learning to power the insights from those platforms is a real fruitful um, opportunity for mental health. Um, and we need to make use of this information more available to inform different treatments and assessments. So ultimately, I hope that one of the things that we can do through technology and AI is to be a bit of a, um, a light to the darkness and mental health and try to reach people more where they're at, which is in these, um, these rivers where they're out there struggling oftentimes by themselves right now. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.
observation? Yeah, I think that um, it's interesting you mentioned that. So definitely we've seen that young people are more likely to sort of enter that pathway. Um, but with some of the older individuals, um, once you can get over either technology literacy issues or technology wariness issues, they actually tend to be sort of higher users. Um, we've also seen this, I've done some work in um, sort of underserved marginalized populations, specifically um, Spanish-speaking Latinos and also homeless youth. And with the Spanish-speaking Latinos, we similarly see there might be a little bit more education that has to happen as we're introducing sort of technology-based um, uh, programs, but actually really like them. And they, especially, you know, with the, the Latinos, they really like the sort of consistent 24 seven report uh, support. It's very much sort of fits, um, aligns with a lot of their values of having these things sort of more integrated into their lives. And so I think there's more barriers, but um, sometimes, but often they seem to really enjoy these things when we overcome those barriers. Any more questions? Um, have you guys looked at the other types of data that you can um, actually detect if someone is depressed, such as, uh, for example, sleep schedule, as you mm -hmm. mentioned, um, you know, variety, the variance of uh, someone um, being in like different locations can give you a, an estimate. Yeah. So for example, like uh, the type of music they listen to, uh, for example, in like Spotify or sleep schedule or food, they can give you a more accurate. Uh, yeah, I, I think the insight is right, and one we've, we've looked into. Interestingly, in the, we looked at sleep within the data that um, I presented, and we had actually pretty good predictive accuracy of sleep, but most of that accuracy was being driven by a single feature, which was time of day. Um, and so people tend to sleep between certain hours. And so if we take all the other features out and just have time of day, it only reduced our predictive accuracy by about um, 3%. Um, and so I think one thing that we need to sort of think about is building better sort of sleep models that are actually sort of responsive. I think one thing that um, in the specific data we did, we did not have it linked to a wearable device. And I think that linking things to wearables would actually be really useful to get better sleep data in that regard. So I think it's a great idea conceptually. We've had challenges getting data, I think, that would accurately represent that. And when you don't have good data, you don't get good results. Just, just to follow up, there's, a, there's a, a kind of a ring that we use mm -hmm. in our research. It's called the Aura ring. Yep. And that is a really good estimate of the different stages of sleep. Um, rapid eye movements, mm -hmm. really high accuracy. So that might be. Yep, awesome. Thanks. Thank you very much. So now we come to the last speaker of this session, Sidney Gola. Uh, he will tell us more about ethic, ethical issues and things like that. Mike. No videos. Well, good afternoon, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, uh, let me start with a, a disclaimer. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I'm not a, an ethicist who works on AI. In fact, I'm not even much of an ethicist. I'm a stem cell person who got interested in stem cell uh, policy, politics, and ethics, went in it from that angle. And uh, so, uh, to use the metaphor that was used this morning, uh, stem cells are my hammer, and so AI is going to be a nail, whether it wants to be or not. Uh, so I'm going, to, I'm going to assume that not everybody knows what stem cells are. Uh, or what ethics is. So I'm going to do one or two slides on each just to catch everybody up. Uh, um, stem cells are, uh, are very interesting. Uh, we talk about pluripotent stem cells as a cell type that, um, let me see if I can figure out how to get it. There we are. Oops. It does want to jump around. Uh, that has two alternate paths. You can make many more of them, which is tremendous for us lab scientists. It means you can make uh, industrial amounts of stem cells uh, because they will replicate uh, easily and repetitively. Or they can take an entirely different path and start to differentiate. 
And a pluripotent stem cell will make many different cell types, in fact, all, almost all cell types in the body. Once they take that path, they begin to lose the capacity to proliferate, so the more differentiated they become, the less pr proliferative they become. Uh, so they are, this is a, a tremendous tool to be able to use. You can make all different cell types and start replacing or repairing damaged or diseased cells. Uh, what could be the problem with that? Well, we get lots of protests, and uh, lots of folks don't think we should be in this business at all, or that we're doing it completely wrong. Uh, the lower left is a uh, is a kind of typical of the kind of protest we get in the United States, uh, which is uh, on religious basis. Stem cell harvesters stop playing God. Uh, this. Uh, this one, I think, took place in Washington, D.C. We had these here on this campus when we opened our stem cell research center. Uh, they're, they're not all uncommon. The other is also becoming increasingly frequent. This one actually took place in Rome, uh, demanding access to stem cells for treatments that the government said were not say, uh, had not passed their safety standards. Uh, it's interesting and I still don't know why uh, stem cell protests in Rome are in English with Italian subtitles. <laughs> um, uh, somebody perhaps has an explanation of that. So uh, um, from both sides, we, we are told either stop doing it or start doing it faster. Uh, this, this is a field in which it uh, gets very involved with uh, politics, policy, and religion, uh, which complicates it greatly. Uh, it probably is not quite as intensive set of issues in AI, but we'll learn from what we had to go through. Uh, why is religion involved in this? And the controversy it has to do almost entirely with the source of the cells. These first three here are pluripotent stem cells. That is, they can make any cell type of the body, or nearly every cell type. The first, and the one that burst on the scene about 20 years ago, uh, with the work of Jamie Thompson in Wisconsin, was that you can obtain uh, pluripotent stem cells from human in vitro fertilization clinic discarded uh, embryos. Four to five day embryos, from IVF procedures, and these would be the excess or the ones not used clinically. And if you dissociated those, you could get a pluripotent stem cell that you could grow and differentiate. Uh, of course, the whole purpose of these blastocysts that were created in these clinics was to make babies. And this is not making babies, this is making stem cells. There are two other ways you can do it. One was extremely controversial, but I'm going to try to minimize my comments on it because I think it's it's no longer much of a, an issue, and that's somatic cell nuclear transfer. That is, taking the DNA from a somatic cell, from an adult cell, and putting it into an enucleated oocyte, egg cell, and creating a blastocyst that way. Uh, that's the same technology that's used to clone animals. Uh, you can also be, create blastocysts this way. Uh, it was tried for years. People attempted to do this. They struggled with it, and they finally only succeeded in 2013. There are a handful of labs still working on it. It was largely oops, replaced by this technology called IPS, which uh, uh, was uh, devised in 2006 uh, by uh, Yamanaka in Japan, and in 2012 he won the Nobel Prize for it. It is a technology for taking an adult cell, uh, uh, regulating its activity with, with four transcription factors, and convincing the cell that it really is an embryonic cell. Uh, if these are not the only cells we deal with. There are also fetal cells obtained from miscarriages or abortions. They have certain particular uses. And adult cells, and of course the kind of gold standard, the first 
cell type that was used clinically as a stem cell therapy is bone marrow for bone marrow transplantation. I'll talk a little bit more about those in a, in a minute. Uh, but if you have any one slide that includes the words embryo, cloning, and fetus, you know you're in, in controversial territory. Uh, so uh, as somebody said, we can grow any, just about anything, including big, complex, ugly, ethical dilemmas. Uh, so what's an ethical dilemma? Before I go on with what the lessons are. Uh, well, ethics is, and morals are essentially synonymous. It's about right versus wrong. But ethical dilemmas are, and, and morals tend to be personal things, uh, sometimes religious, whereas ethics, and what I'll be talking about, are standards, uh, societal standards, community standards, or importantly, are professional standards that we use in, in our own uh, uh, professional programs in, as scientists. So, what is a dilemma is the conflict between mutually exclusive options for action, all of which are morally, are, are moral, are ethical, are appropriate, but all of which also have an undesirable consequence. So it's a right versus right question, or often sometimes a wrong versus less, less wrong question that we have to wrestle with, where there's an undesirable outcome from the most moral question. And people, philosophers, have worried about this for, for centuries. In fact, the first example that I know of is, is in Plato, who tells a story of a man uh, who uh, borrowed an object from his neighbor. The neighbor comes back and says, I want it back. But the object was a weapon. And between the time he lent it to, to his neighbor and the current time, the man had gone insane and was no longer to be trusted with this weapon. And so the, the conflict is, I owe it to him, if he owns it, I'm withholding it from him, but he's not competent to use it, he's a danger to himself and to others. It's kind of a fourth century BC gun control question. Um, or sword control question, I guess it would. Uh, there are other many examples, Archwork took that one and built it into a much more nuanced question. But the, the answer, the, the, the lesson from it is that ethical decisions are going to have a moral residue. That is, they're going to have, when you say, I'm not going to give the weapon to my neighbor because he's danger with it, you're making a decision to do something wrong. You've changed borrowing to stealing. And that might be the right decision, but there's an ethical component to it that you're going to have to wrestle with. I think we do this all the time without or always recognizing it or, or appreciating it. So let's be specific with how we wrestle with some of these in, 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 uh, in stem cells and how it might apply. The field, as I said, broke open in 1998. So we have a clear demarcation point when we said we can make a human embryonic stem cell, pluripotent stem cell. The first question was, what's the moral status of that? And that consumed the field for the next decade. Then there's the cloning question. People are starting to mix and match human and animal cells. There's a question of people are donating oocytes, embryos, skin cells, sperm cells. So now with new technology, you could make sperm cells and egg cells from skin cells. What's the moral status of an embryo created that way? And then there's access to therapies and the cost. So we've, those were the issues that I think we started wrestling with. This is a blastocyst. This is, question is, what's its moral status? It's 100, 150 cells. It's got two cell types only. It has no nerves, no sensory organs. It has uh, an outer shell of cells, which makes a placenta, and an inner core of cells, which makes a baby. Only two cell types, two potentials. Religion is not going to solve this problem for us as scientists. It has settled certain policy issues depending on the country, the dominant religion of the country. Uh, but there's two views. Destroying the embryo is wrong. 
it's a potential life, uh, or it's acceptable, morally acceptable, because it's not yet a life, it's not yet a personality, it's not yet a, a sentient being. And rather than go through the, the basis of all of these, let's just say that it did not solve our problem. We did develop a policy in this country based largely on the left-hand side of this equation, of this dispute. Uh, the George W. Bush administration, uh, no new cell lines were developed. And this was not a solution that was greeted well by either the public or Congress. Uh, Congress actually twice passed uh, legislation to overturn the Bush policy. It was twice vetoed. Uh, once a Republican Congress, once a Democratic Congress. So it was a very bipartisan view. Uh, and we struggled with this, and then it became irrelevant. And I think that's an important thing to understand, that this was a consuming issue. This was the top ethical issue with the, of the field, national legislation about it, and so on. And we were restricted to 21 cell lines during the Bush policy. Two things happened. One, uh, in 2009, President Obama changed the executive order governing this and said, with regard to uh, NIH appropriations, uh, we could develop new cell lines, and 400 cell lines were approved. That's enough, actually, to do almost anything we want to. But then along came this IPS cell, and there's, there's many more in Europe, and in Canada, and so on. Then along came the IPS, and uh, we probably have a thousand here at UCI developed by IPS. Thousands of such cell lines are now created. So there are almost no laboratories deriving these from embryos anymore. It's completely changed. This is how IPS works. It's basically you take a skin cell and you shove in four transcription factors and you get a, at a 1% level, you get a, a pluripotent stem cell. So philosophy didn't do it. I didn't go through the philosophical issues. Religious doctrines were, were, uh, did not allow consensus. But the creation of enough cell lines just eliminated the issue, uh, especially with IPS allowing us to do it less expensive with less controversy. So I think the first lesson that we learned from stem cell experience is that scientific process, uh, progress will resolve some issues. That is, we're going charging past them by figuring out ways to do it without some of the problems. I think we have to keep looking for those. But it wouldn't have happened, I think, except for the feeling that there had to be another way to get at this without, without embryos. And Yamanaka's lab went into it with that feel. Now, the controversy on that it's going to be a life has not ended. The best source for human neuroprogenitor cells, a cell that can make uh, several different cell types, uh, like a neuron, an astrocyte, algodendrocyte, the cells you need to make a central nervous system, the best source for that is from the fetal brain. And where do we get those fetal brain cells? From abortions. Uh, and Abortion, uh, fetal research is highly regulated, always has been, or uh, well before the stem cell world got involved in it. And so there's all kinds of limits that are, are placed on anybody who wants to use fetal cells for research. We can work within these limits. People have worked within these limits. They're not uh, inappropriate. But um, they are also assumed that we will continue to use fetal cells. Uh, that is not popular with some parts of, of our country, uh, including all the people who sent the UCI Stem Cell Research Center, all those uh, uh, Public Records Act requests 
for who bought the cells, for how much, from where, and who signed the invoice. Uh, a, a attempt to, uh, to intimidate, very clearly. Um, the, uh, this has been a controversy about using fetal cells. And uh, in this case, clearly the pendulum is tipping towards the anti-abortion, anti-fetal cell use. NIH is restricting, is revealing its, uh, its policies. There's a growing number of states where no kind of research will be allowed. In fact, no abortions will be allowed. And so here's a case where politics can overwhelm science. And the politics may be out of our reach, out of our control. We can inform it, we can argue on it, but this is, this is not a scientifically based decision. This is a political decision about how things ought to go. Just to give you a sense of the nature of this conversation, I've always found this interesting. Here's two quotes uh, about stem cells from politicians. Uh, politicians, uh, one says, we ought to be able to do this. There ought to be a way to be respectful and still do this. And the second says, it's the use of science to desensitize society over the killing of babies. What's amazing about these two quotes is they're from the same person. Um, <laughs> uh, the former world speaker, Lars Newt Gingrich. Uh, what's different about them, of course, is the timing. Um, one was during the George Bush administration, and the other was during the Obama administration. Um, and so that illustrates the intensity of the political issue and how uh, the science is going to get pushed aside. Uh, I'm going to skip through these, but let's say cloning was a very controversial issue. It's another one where the science has passed it by. Uh, I'll skip the cloning and similarly chimeras, uh, which in fact George Bush included in two State of the Union addresses, saying we need to be very worried about this. The, the mixing of human and animal cells. And, uh, this has also turned out to be a non-issue, although there is legislation that's on the books in our neighboring state of Arizona that prohibits certain kind of experiments with human and animal cells. Uh, so, but I don't want to spend too much time on that. Instead, I'd rather spend time on this. Uh, defining the rights of the donors. So when we got into this, we know we're getting the cells from IVF clinics. Somebody has to say, yes, you can use these cells. And um, there was and has been no legislation on this. There are no uh, laws that govern who, who can say yes. But there are clear guidelines, and they were developed by the scientific community. Uh, the, uh, the first set of important guidelines came from the National Academy of Sciences, which uh, convened a group to look at what, what should we do and what should we not do in the stem cell field. Uh, that was followed up by the International Society for Stem Cell Research, which took those guidelines or came to the same general conclusions but internationalize them. And other scientific groups, I remember in that period being asked by three different scientific societies to help them draw up uh, a set of, of limits and, and guidelines. Uh, so scientific groups everywhere were trying to figure out what should we do in the stem cell field, what should we not do. And we came to consensus on key points. First of all, if people want to donate sperm, egg, embryos, it has to be given away. We're not going to buy them. And secondly, it has to be clearly informed consent about what they're doing. We have to know where these cells and tissues came from. If we get a, a cell line from another country, did they go through a similar process? Where do we get these? We're not going to do reproductive cloning. We're not going to deal with, with chimeras that are reproducing human organs. And crucially, we're going to have an oversight mechanism at the local level. 
this is really quite important that we developed a set of guidelines that we could operationalize at the campus level. Uh, so uh, here at UCI, we developed a, an oversight committee appointed in 2005. It was, I think, the second one appointed in the UC system. The first one at San Francisco had been in existence for a different set of reasons and was converted to it. So, uh, and now all, all research universities in California and most in the United States have similar committees. It was a kind of roughly modeled on IRBs. It had patient advocates, science policy, ethics, medicine, clinical investigators, and stem cell scientists. And it looked at compliance with state laws. Here in California, we have a, an agent, a stem cell agency, the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, but also the federal ones, as well as the science. And informed other oversight bodies, like the IOB. Uh, this is what these cells are, what they can do, what they can't do. Uh, this is a long list of the issues that this committee has looked at. Um, going from derivation of cells, from blastocysts, from, to genetic reprogramming, to generation of gametes, to development of, of brain tissues in culture, two minutes, to clinical use. And here's, I think, the important lessons from that. First of all, a developing field needs accountability, a way to say who did what and who's responsible for it. And uh, we established in the stem cell field, a good accountability system where we can, we know what is it, what is going on, and and have some capacity to prevent the worst abuses. Uh, and that the professional ethical guidelines have been important in the field. In fact, they were central to our development of the program in California, which then, uh, in fact, were incorporated into the policy of the state in its, in its program. There's a bunch of federal laws in the field. Almost none of them have any influence. I'm not going to go through them. Uh, there is one federal law that does, which says you cannot create or destroy an embryo for research. It's called the Dickey Wicker Amendment. It's added every year to the NIH appropriation. Uh, we worked around that by using other funds to create embryos uh, to, to uh, destroy embryos, not to create embryos. Uh, but in general, federal legislations have little impact on the way we do this field, except for providing some money, particularly in the training area. Whereas California passed Prop 71, which put $3 billion into it, making it the leading, making California the leading place to do stem cell research. $120 million of that came to our campus. But more, more importantly, it provided priorities and guidelines about how to do it. And that came directly from the professional development. So uh, federal legislation shouldn't be expected to solve the problems we think need to be solved. Uh, I end up with the clinical one. Uh, I think most of the clinical issues of, of treating patients with stem cells will be solved, but there's a, that is, how to equitably distribute them. The costs are going to be high initially. Um, but there's a tremendous demand for unproven therapies and an excessive hype in the field. You want an example of excessive hype? He was the first ever bra that causes stem cells to home to a woman's breast. Um, it's got to be true, it's on the internet. Um, uh, well, this is silly, obviously, um, but it's probably mostly harmless. Uh, these are not harmless. These are stem cell clinics transplanting cells. This one was turned up, in, the one on the right turned up in my mailbox. I uh, don't know who they thought they were mailing it to. Um, the, the one on the upper left is a clinic in Texas. 
Oh, that was uh, one of its uh, well-known patients was the then governor of Texas, Rick Perry, now Secretary of Energy. Uh, that clinic was closed by the FDA. Uh, now it's in existence in Mexico. That's a group on the lower left. Uh, this is a clinic in Newport Beach, advertising all the diseases you can treat, including rheumatoid arthritis, autoimmune hepatitis, uh, arthritis, uh, uh, Parkinson's disease, so on. None of these are FDA approved. In fact, this is a map of the non-FDA approved uh, clinics selling stem cell therapies in the United States. Uh, there's a tremendous cluster of them, you may notice, around Southern California. Southern California, Florida, and a few other places. Uh, so that's the last lesson of it. That doubtful and even dangerous versions of a new technology will appear if we haven't been vigilant about ruling them out. Uh, I will end with the suggested two pages to read. Two recent editorials in, uh, in Nature. Uh, if two pages too much, read the second one. Uh, it's a really good article about the need to develop this kind of uh, uh, user-based um, guidelines from, from the uh, um, uh, point of view. And then you'll just find it harder and harder to get any work done because the ethicists will be hanging around. Thank you.